Well, good evening. Welcome to the Bible study hour. I am Pastor Joel McGarvey, and I'm coming to you from Bible Doctrines to Live By. I trust you've had a good day and that uh, we will have a great time tonight as we continue our study in rightly dividing the word of truth. So let's get going and let's open with a word of prayer, shall we? Father, we are thankful tonight that we have this opportunity to come together once again. And we, are, we pray, Father, that as we do so, that you would be honored and glorified. May your word be our teacher and be our guide. And uh, Father, just may all things here tonight be done to bring honor and glory to you and to you alone. And we pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, good evening. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's about five o'clock. And I would hope that we have been on the road for several hours by now. Uh, we have a, not a real long drive today and tomorrow, but we have a, a drive that I wanted to split into two. And so uh, we are on the road. Now, wait a minute. You say, you're on the road. You're speaking to us. Yeah, I know. But uh, we recorded this uh, <laughs> on Wednesday at afternoon at 8 o'clock on the 8th of, of, uh, of September, just so we could be with you tonight and not miss the night and also fulfill our obligations. We completed our RV camping Bible conference. Uh, this morning I spoke in the Alpha, Old Bethel Bible Church in Alpha, Kentucky, um, and uh, then we departed, and now we are on our way north back towards Grand Rapids, uh, I think by now we're somewhere uh, in northern Kentucky, if not coming into uh, Indiana. So uh, just pray for us as we travel. And we'll, back, we'll be back in the office tomorrow uh, around noon, or if not before. But, uh, you know, we're thankful for the, the summer ministry that we had. We had a, a, just a, a lot of blessings over the summer and a lot, got to meet some new people. Uh, and uh, have a great times of fellowship, great times of Bible study. And again, we're praising the Lord for uh, the number of kids who, uh, first of all, came to Christ as Savior. And of course, we're, we, don't, we don't leave off the other ones because we had many more hear the gospel. And uh, the seeds have been sown. And you know, in reality, uh, we can sow and we can water, but it's God who gives the increase. And all we've been asked to do in our lives, your life and my life, is to be a faithful seed sower, a faithful waterer. Um, you will never save anybody. I will never save anybody. Only God can save them. But you and I have been called to be his ambassador, uh, his servant, and uh, to share the glorious gospel of the grace of God with the lost world. And, and, and in that, we need to be found faithful. And we're thankful for the number of kids this summer who did hear the gospel. And, uh, and we're thankful for the many uh, who responded. Uh, and, and you know what? You never know for sure. There, there could have been others who were there who heard and responded, and, and we just don't know about it. So, but we're going to leave that in God's hands. And we're just thankful for the summer uh, that we did have. Uh, that is there. So let's get uh, to it here. Don't forget our Tuesday night Bible time. Uh, I believe that will be Matt's last program. I think that will be Matt's last program. If it's not Matt's last program, you'll see me there Tuesday night uh, as we pick up again on our unfolding uh, the word of truth. But uh, I believe it's Matt's last night. And uh, as Matt draws it to a close again, I want to thank him for the uh, superb job that he did all summer in doing the Tuesday night Bible time and the study on Evangelism 101. Uh, so appreciative of what he has done. Uh, appreciate, uh, appreciate all that he does with us here at Bible Doctrines. Uh, I think I said last week, I, I use a term, he, he was truly a godsend. And we're thankful for him and uh, for his partnership his labor here with us here at Bible Doctrine. So <clears throat> be in prayer for Matt uh, and uh, Tuesday night Bible time. 
uh, 7 o'clock right here at Bible Doctrines to Live by Facebook page. And, and I think that we'll start up live uh, next week again with the YouTube page. Uh, it'll be live rather than by delay. So uh, we'll look into that and hopefully, and like I said a couple weeks ago, uh, we're looking at adding additional platforms that we can come to you. So um, <clears throat> one of them introduced this week, another one I already had in mind. So we're going to see how those work out and what we need to do. Uh, whether they're live or by delay, I'm not sure. But either way, we're going to be expanding our outreach and our opportunities for people to catch the Bible study hour, Tuesday Bible time, and coming up, the programming for children that we will be starting in just a few weeks. So be in prayer for that as well. So don't forget also coming up, the Mid-Atlantic Grace Bible Conference uh, coming up October 8th, 9th, and 10th at the LaVale, uh, Maryland Holiday Inn Express. And uh, Pastor Brent Biller from Grace Bible Fellowship <coughs> will be speaking, as well as myself and Pastor Kevin Sadler from the Berean Bible Society will be speaking. We have uh, two sessions on, on uh, Friday night. I believe there's four sessions on Saturday, and then two sessions on Sunday, I think. I, I could be wrong on that. But it is a full schedule, and it's going to be a good time together. The theme, our present, rooted in our past, uh, the splendor of time. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm uh, excited about the conference, excited about being there, and uh, I trust that you will uh, take advantage of that. I will say again, as I've said every week, I know that there are still conference rooms uh, available, and and you need to get you need to get in on that deal. And I, I'm telling you, it's a deal, but you can only get it when you contact Pastor Biller. So there on your screen, you see his address: Brent Biller at AtlanticBB.net. That's it. Brent Biller at Atlantic bb.net you can email him there or you can call him at 304-726-4063 that's 304-726-4063 and and I trust (coughs) that you will do that but like I said you can only get the conference room rate by going to Brent Biller. You cannot call the hotel. It doesn't matter whether you're a AAA member or an AMAC member, or it doesn't matter. You cannot get the deal that you will get by calling Brent Biller or emailing him. And so I would encourage you, get those rooms. Get one of those rooms while they last. So give him a call. <clears throat> Again, 304 726 4063, and I know that he would love uh, to hear from you. <clears throat> Don't forget our Bible study materials, our gospel tracts, our graded curriculum, all that we have here at Bible Doctrines. We encourage the, the Bible, the study of God's Word. We encourage evangelism through the gospel tracts, and also there are teaching tracts that can be handed out, and uh, those are there. And then graded curriculum that can be used for Sunday school, home school, uh, home Bible studies, wherever, uh, personal Bible study if you'd like, but they are all there, graded curriculums. All of them are available on our website. Uh, A little sample of each one is available on the website uh, to check that out. Um, And they're all, we, we, we sell them all, but we sell them with the permission to copy. So you don't have to worry about copyrights and making copies for fellow teachers. Uh, all you need is, is really one, and you can copy it and give it to everybody else. So um, that's, that's up to you what you do with it. But that's all there. So uh, if you'd like that, you can get uh, one of our catalogs by calling our, our office at 616-785-3618. That's 616-785-3618. Or... You can send us an email, request a catalog 
through staff at BibleDoctrines.org. That's staff at BibleDoctrines.org. Or you can go to our website at BibleDoctrines.org. And uh, everything is there for you. You can see it all there in the resource center, the store. Uh, you can purchase it there if you'd like. I will tell you this. It'd save you a little bit of money if you find out what you want and then call the office or find out what you want and send us an email. <clears throat> it's a little cheaper than ordering online and uh, we have nothing to do with the, the shipping and handling charges. Those are all assigned uh, by the credit company, but uh, we have nothing to do with that. So uh, anyway, keep that in mind. If you're interested in any of that information, give us a call, 616 785 3618, and we will get a catalog off to you right away. All right, let's get into our study. And just last week, last week we were looking at <clears throat> some of the things that as we come through our transition, and we, we've seen that, that second program, the body of Christ. Uh, we see that beginning now under the leadership of the Apostle Paul. We see that beginning in Acts chapter 13. And, and uh, there we have a new leader, a new leader. Saul of Tarsus was never the leader. The Apostle Paul is the leader. We have a new message. We have a new message. That message is the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is held out for the first time as good news or glad tidings. For the first time... The cross of Christ is held out as glad tidings. Um, and so we have that. We also have in Acts chapter 13 the fact that, that now by belief we are saved and we are justified and we are declared righteous by which the law was incapable of doing or is incapable of doing. And so we have a... We have a uh, a new program, we have a new leader, we have a, a new message that is introduced to us in Acts chapter 13. And, and, and taking that forward, we were looking at that last week, we talked about that transitional period, we talked about things that were going on during that transitional period, but the, that period that would draw to a close. And, and as we were uh, drawing to a close last week, we were talking about the fact that and the Word of God says that uh, tongues and healings and these things were all done, a lot of these things were done in part, but when that which is perfect is come, that which was in part would be done away. It would end. It would fail. <clears throat> and then we see in Colossians chapter 1 where this mystery, this mystery revelation that was given to the Apostle Paul concerning this age of grace, uh, this doctrine of the church, the body of Christ, this mystery was given to fulfill or complete or make full the word of God and, and to bring it to its maturity. And so with the writings of the Apostle Paul, uh, all of those things, as, as Paul would receive his message, as Paul received his message, then these other things would die off and would come to a close. And, and as Paul drew his message uh, to a close, as the Spirit drew that message, that revelation to Paul to a close, now we had the Word of God. Uh, now, all of those things that were done in part, all of those things would pass away. And, and uh, you know, it sounds rather harsh, but when you, when you rightly divide the Word of Truth, and, and you see these programs that are there in Scripture. And you get that understanding of some of these things are not really for the church, the body of Christ. They're not, they're not given to the church, the body of Christ. Yes, the Apostle Paul did practice tongues. Yes, he, he did do, do the healing. But as we saw last week, all of those came to a close. All of those came to a close. And even in the tongues, he was very careful to regulate that as to exactly what that was for, because even under the old program, apparently it had been uh, begun to be abused 
by that program. And Paul really brought it down, and especially in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Paul really brings that down and talks about the fact of, of, of being careful on the abuse of it, uh, that it's not given to just everybody and it's not given for everybody. Uh, and so you have to understand that. But you, you have to see that as we're dealing with these two programs now, you can see the one program as, as a program, that one program has come to an end. It has ceased. And God has another program that is that at first is growing and then takes hold and moves forward. And that new program is that mystery program, that glorious gospel, the grace of God. It is that program dealing with the church, the body of Christ. Uh, and so we have that. We have Israel with, a, with an earthly prophesied program. And we have the church, the body of Christ, with a heavenly, unprophesied mystery program. And we have the gospel of circumcision, the gospel of the kingdom, and we have the gospel of the grace of God. And also in Galatians 2, it's referred to as the gospel of the uncircumcision. Because those things that were part of that Jewish program, those things would be, would be brought to a close. Uh, circumcision was given as the token, the outward sign of that covenant that God made with Moses, and in, in or with Abraham rather, uh, and in making that, in making that, uh, with his people, these are these will be my people. These are the Hebrew people. He gave them circumcision. He gave them circumcision, and circumcision was was a requirement to be part of that program. So even one born into the into the family, born into the family, wouldn't really be part of that family and part of a recipient of the promises and the covenants without that circumcision that was given. So if they, if they uh, denied the circumcision, then they were denied the benefit uh, that was there. And, and, and really, they would be put out. They would be put out. Uh, and so we have to see that. And, and so we talk about circumcision today. Yes, we many circumcised today, but it's it's not done for religious purposes. It's done uh, for, for medical purposes. I, years ago, I had a woman tell me she had her son circumcised by a rabbi for, for, script, for biblical uh, purposes. And, I, I, and I, what, what were they? Well, they go back to the Old Testament. And, and they, they would force that on their sons uh, to do that for biblical purposes. And in, re in reality, that's come to an end. That's come to an end. Uh, today, circumcision is carried out for medical reasons, and we have many people today are saying no to, to the, to the uh, act. Oh, no, we don't want that. Um, and, you know, there's pluses and minuses on all that, medically speaking, for people's health. However, um, biblically speaking, uh, it is not a token uh, of that relationship between man and God and that circumcision makes me part of his people, which is what it was intended for initially. So we see that as that transition goes on, there are these changes and Paul healed early on, but as the transition closed off at the end of the book of Acts, Paul was no longer able to heal. Now he had to give them a prescription for a medicine. We saw he wrote to Timothy. He said, take a little wine for thy stomach's sake. Um, and so we see these kinds of things that were being done, and they were, not part of the, they were not part of the program of God. They were there for a purpose, and they were there for a purpose, but their purpose would come to an end, and, and that purpose would pass away. Uh, and so we have to understand that. And so that's why, as we read last week in 1 Corinthians, how those things were done in part, but the day would come when they would fail, when they would cease, when they would pass away. Um, and that would all come when the word of God reaches its maturity, its, its uh, perfect level, its perfection, its made full, Colossians chapter 1. And that would happen, as in Paul says, that he received the revelation of the mystery to make the word of God, to bring the word of God to completion, to perfection.
to maturity, uh, to make full. And so we understand that the writings of the Apostle Paul accomplished what was wait missing or what was they were waiting for in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13. So we see all of that as we go along, and there are other practices, uh, things that are done. And, and I'll tell you, folks, when you learn, to, especially when you learn to rightly divide, now I'm not talking about those who have been taught in ignorance. I'm not talking about those who, and maybe ignorance is too harsh of a word, but for those who are taught not knowing better, not rightly dividing the word of truth. I'm not talking so much about them, but I will say this. If you've been taught the word of God, rightly divided, and you understand the word of God, rightly divided, and you understand that there, were two, there, are, there are two programs, and one of those programs has now gone off the, the, the scene for a season, for a period, but one day when the church, the body of Christ is raptured away, God is going to pick up that other program again. When you realize all of that, uh, you realize that those certain things are no longer, that were once required, are no longer required, and they're really no longer a part uh, of the program, of the program. Uh, I want you to look, if you will, to, to, to just one verse, uh, two verses offhand, uh, and then we're going to go into 1 Corinthians. Two verses, Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. In Matthew chapter 28, Jesus is about ready to ascend back into to glory. He's died, he was buried, he rose again. Now for 40 days he's been teaching his disciples in the things pertaining to the kingdom. That's that earthly program of God, Acts chapter 1. Uh, and, and here he gives them that, these marching orders. He says, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. All right. Now, go over to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. We have Mark's account of what is often referred to as the Great Commission. We read that in Matthew's account, in Matthew 28. Now we have Mark's account. And, and again, folks, look at the context. I'm not going to do it tonight here, but look at the context of the commissions that were given in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. Uh, Matthew 28, uh, Luke tw uh, Mark 16, John 19, and 20, uh, Luke 24, Acts chapter 1. Look at the context. Look at the setting. All of them were given during that same 40-day period. There, there ought be no debate as to which one of these is for us, which ones are not. Uh, they're all given in that period when Jesus was teaching the 12, or the 11, in the things pertaining to the kingdom, the earthly kingdom that was going to be established here on earth. And and before that can happen, before that can happen, Jesus said in Matthew, the gospel of the kingdom had to be preached in all the world, in all the world. And so now he is about ready to go back into heaven, to ascend into heaven. He is about ready to give to them the things. In Acts chapter 2, Peter will stand and they will offer the kingdom to the nation of Israel and this kingdom is given on the promise. But first of all, the, na the world, the, the nations have to hear the gospel of the kingdom. That's what Jesus said. And so he's commissioning the 12, the 11, soon to be 12, to go where? To go in all the world. To go into all the world and preach the gospel. What gospel? The gospel of the kingdom. And, and so he says here in Mark, Mark chapter 16, verse 15, And he, that's Jesus, said unto them, that's the eleven, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. To every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Now what does... What does the book say? What does the Bible say? What does the word of God say here? 
These people are being sent. They are being sent into all the world. They're being sent into all the world with a specific message. That's the gospel of the kingdom. And the gospel of the kingdom is he that believes and is baptized. And then the result of their belief and their baptism is they shall be saved. They shall be saved. Now, I know that there are those who twist it and say, well, he didn't really mean it that way. I mean, that's the way God gave it, but God didn't really mean what he said there. He did, it just came out wrong. I mean, that's the only way you can say about it. They, they like to twist it and say what he, really, what he really meant was, he that believeth shall be saved and should be baptized. I mean, you see, that's not what God said. God didn't misspeak here. God said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That was the same message John the Baptist came. That was the same message Jesus preached. He that believeth and is baptized, be baptized for the forgiveness of sin, for the remission of sin, for the remission of sin. Baptized for the remission of sin. That's the message. That's the message. And that's the message that Jesus was commissioning the 11 disciples, the apostles, to take into all the world this gospel of the kingdom. This gospel of the kingdom that had to be made known into all the world before he could come back again. Before he could come back again. This has to happen. This has to happen. And it's a requirement. It's a requirement. These people were specifically sent to preach and to preach this gospel, and that he that believes that gospel and is baptized shall be saved. Now, look over at 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Now, there are those who say that Paul, the Apostle Paul, was operating under those commissions under those words that you and I operate under those words. Now, there are those who would say, well, we don't operate under the, Ma the Mark uh, commission. We do operate under the Matthew commission uh, because it doesn't say shall be saved. It just says baptized. But we, we operate under that one, but not under the Mark uh, aspect, the, his viewpoint. Mark, maybe Mark's wrong. Um, the problem with it is, folks, is they were all given again at the same time. It's just four different viewpoints on the same commission. That's all it is. That's all it is. And, and, and really, in, in Acts chapter 2, uh, I know I, I told you, stay where you are. I'll just go back here and read this to you. But in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, it, it, and, and uh, it says here, uh, when they say, when they are pricked in their heart, after hearing Peter's message of who Jesus truly was, and, and how they by wicked and cruel hands took and slew him, hanged him on a cross, and they are pricked in their hearts, pricked in their hearts, and, and, and they say unto Peter, what shall we do? And Peter's response unto them is, believe, just believe, believe. No, he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, for the forgiveness of sins. You see, that's the same message that was preached before the cross. That's the same message that John the Baptist came preaching. That's the same message Jesus preached. That's the same message that was there in Matthew chapter 16, in Mark chapter 16. That's the same message. And here it is, Peter, on the day of Pentecost, when they say, what must we do? Peter gives them exactly what Jesus had just told them. That was the program that was underway. That was part of the program that was underway. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, along comes the Apostle Paul. Along comes the Apostle Paul. And, and, and he talks about this division that's come into the church Oh, oh and, and, and some are saying, well, I'm a Peter, and I'm a Cephas, and, 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 and I'm of Apollos. And, and, and Paul says in verse 13, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? 
Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Well, the answer is no. And then he says, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say, I had baptized in my own name, in my own name. Then he goes on to say, oh, and I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides not, I know not whether I baptized any other. Now, there's a lot in those verses. There's a lot in those verses. But could Peter come along and say, I thank God I baptized none of you? No, he had to. He had to. Could Peter come along and, and in some lackadaisical way say, well, I baptized these guys and these guys and, oh yeah, I baptized this guy over here. No, they could never say that. They could never say that. What did, what did Paul say though? If, if, you, if you go on, verse 17, he says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. That we take away from the cross. Listen, anything that takes away from the cross, anything that detracts from the cross, detracts from the gospel. Because the gospel is all wrapped up in the cross. But he says, for Christ sent me not to baptize. Could Peter say that? No. Peter couldn't say that. Could James say that? No. Could John say that? No. Could, could any of the, of the disciples, the apostles say that? No. Why? Because they were specifically sent to do that specifically sent to do that, to preach the gospel and to baptize. Mark chapter 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, shall be saved. But then along comes the apostle Paul and he says, but Christ sent me not to baptize, not to baptize. How, how could he say that? How could he say that? He could say that because baptism, water baptism, has no part in the program of God for the church, the body of Christ. No part in the church program for the church, the body of Christ. You know, I understand today there are those who are coming along and they're saying, you know, we, we ought to... For, for those churches that don't water baptize, and, and if you're joining us and you're not aware of that, I, I don't water baptize, never have. Um, but there are those who, are, who, are, who for years would have stood beside me and say, no, we, we can't water baptize. We don't, we don't believe that that's necessary for today. Um, but there are, among that group now, there are some who are saying, well, you know, if we would water baptize, we could get more people in our church. Oh, we realize that it's not really for us today, but it doesn't hurt anything. And it is, after all, it's tradition. We can do it oh, after tradition. You know, we need to be real careful with tradition. It's not the subject of our text tonight, our study tonight, but I would imagine that if you went back and you followed the teachings of Jesus, he didn't have a lot of good to say about human traditions or religious traditions, the traditions of man, the traditions of man. You know, look over Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. And verse, oh, verse 4. Verse 4. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you. That's 
lead you astray, deceive you, beguile you with enticing words. Remember Paul said not with flattering words, not with big words, lest it detracts you from the gospel. Well, that's somewhat here. With enticing words, persuasive language. Persuasive language. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. <clears throat> steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Your unwavering, your unmovable position in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk ye in him. Conduct yourself in him. Continue in him, in Christ. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with the, uh, thanksgiving. <clears throat> what is Paul saying here? Stay true. Stay true. In all of these assemblies Paul was writing to, there was an undercurrent of people coming in there. There had been the Judaizers who wanted them to go back under the law and, and, and practice all the traditions of Judaism and bring all of that in. They had undermined it. There were the Gnostics and there, were, there was the asceticism. There was all of these things that were coming in. There was, there was great tension in the churches in Paul's day. There was great tension in, in the church. You had, you had, previous to that, you had the, 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 the strict religious Jews. The strict religious Jews. Now, they're the ones, by that I mean, they're the ones who led in the crucifixion of Christ. They're the ones who Saul of Tarsus went to try to find and bring back to Jerusalem. And, and, and they would... They would uh, Sometimes they would beat them, sometimes they whip them, sometimes they kill them. But they were after, they wanted to stop that. So you had those religious Jews. But then along came those of the way. Those were the followers of Messiah. Those were the followers of Messiah. And, and they're the ones that these people hated. And, and so there was that tension there between those two groups, fighting, going back and forth, that undercurrent that would always seek to destroy the way and get these people and get these people. And, and there was that tension. But then eventually, along comes this guy called Paul. Paul. And, 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 and now, in a way, Paul is standing with a different gospel than than the, the way these people, and of course, obviously, he's opposed to the religious leaders and, and that religious Judaism, that just that humanistic Judaism that is there, a denial of, 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 of Jesus Christ, a, a real denial of God and opposition to God. We have all of that. Yet they're just, they're Jews by birth, they're Jews by their you know, they go to synagogue and they do those things, but they don't really believe. Then you have those of the way. These were the believers the, uh, and the Messiah. The, they're messianic believers. They're, they put their faith in the Messiah. They've, they've repented. They were baptized. They're in there. That's them. And then comes Paul. Along comes Paul. And, and Paul is, is here. He's speaking against the traditions He's also speaking against these practices, circumcision, baptism, uh, works, all of these things that, that these believers, these believers were holding out. And so you have this tension this way, but now you bring in a third and there's this tension that is going on. And, and Paul's addressing that in, first, in Colossians chapter 2, in Colossians chapter 2. And, and he says, root it and build up in him and establish in the faith, in the faith, that the faith, that definite article, the there, identifies the faith as a body of truth. Not just one's faith in Christ, but it's a body of truth. It's like a church's statement of faith. It is what we believe and it encompasses all these various elements 
that we believe as those who are in Christ. And he says we are to be rooted and, and established and built up in the faith. And of course, if we're rooted and established and built up in the faith, we will be steadfast, as he said in verse 5, being steadfast. And he says, rooted and built up and established in the faith as you have been taught, where abounding therein with thanksgiving. Then look at verse 9, Colossians 2, verse 9, beware. See, now here comes a word of caution. A word of caution, because there are going to be those who are going to come against you. And it's no less true today. There are those who are going to come against you. They're going to come against you in several ways. But he says here, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophies and vain deceit or, or worthless empty lies. Well, you know, a lot of times, you know, a lot of religion may sound very good, very good. Satan has a way of twisting the truth into a very acceptable lie, a very acceptable lie. And then look what he says. He says, spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments, the, the, the worldly principles of the world and not according to Christ, not after Christ. Do you see what he's saying there? See what he's saying there? There's going to be people that come along and they're going to try to deceive you. They'll try to draw you away. They're going to draw you away with things that sound very, very good. But it's, it's just empty, vain deceit. It's the traditions of man. Again, the traditions. Well, you know what? We ought to, we ought to practice this because it's, it's a tradition. It's a tradition. So? So? Is it part of the program? Well, no, it's not really part of the program, but it's tradition. People want to see it. If people want that. Is it part of the program? Well, no. Well, if it's not part of the program, then it's wrong. It's wrong. Paul had to answer several times. He had to take people and, and answer several times as to, listen, this isn't part of the program. This isn't part of the program. Circumcision, the Jerusalem Council, this isn't part of my program. This isn't part of the program. Baptism, this isn't part of the program. This is part of the old program. This is part of the, the, the program dealing with the nation of Israel. This is a part of the program dealing with that great commission. We're not under the great commission. That's not our program. See, water baptism, folks, was a work of righteousness. It was a work of righteousness. It was, it was a work. It was a work that they had to do. Circumcision was a work. Keeping of the law, the sacrificial system, it was a work. That's what it was. It was a work. It was something they had to do. And they, and they had to do it. 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 
the sacrificial system was not something one time and is done, it was daily. Daily. Circumcision was once, baptism was once, but it was, it was still something they had to do. They had to do. I, I, I don't really want to take time now to, to look at uh, James chapter 2. And there are those who twist James and want to make it say something that it really isn't saying. If you just allow James to speak for itself, it's very obvious what James is talking about. And that is that works and faith go together. Works and faith go together. And like I said earlier, or last week or earlier, that James's primary application is in the tribulational period. And in the tribulational period, they're going to have to be doing, 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 doing to overcome, to overcome, to endure to the end. They're going to have to do and do and do and do and do. It's not faith alone. It's not faith alone. You see, when you go on with the Apostle Paul, he says, but I am not sent to baptize, but to preach the gospel. It's the gospel that is key to Paul. And that baptism will, will fade away, will go away. It's because it's not part of the program. In fact, in the writings of Paul, it receives very little attention. Very little attention. We see it in Romans 6, when it talks about the baptism of Christ and Calvary. That wasn't a water baptism, that's a dry baptism. A dry baptism. There are, uh, I believe, 16 different baptisms in the scripture, and over half of them are dry. Over half of them are dry. Romans chapter 6, when it talks about our being baptized into Christ, is our identification with his death, burial, and resurrection. That baptism is being placed into Christ. That happens the moment we put our faith and trust in Christ. At the very moment we, we, we trust in Christ, we are baptized into Christ. That's the work of the Holy Spirit baptizing us into Christ. There's no human hands involved in the whole thing. It's all an act of God. An act of God, not the preacher, not the priest, not the rabbi. It's an act of God. And that's why Paul would come along in Ephesians chapter 2 when he says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You see, when we start to rightly divide the word of truth, when we start to rightly divide the word of truth, then we begin to see that these things that were once practiced, these things have fallen away. They're not part of the program of God in this age of grace in which we live today, in which we live today. There's, there are all, there's, there's these little things, these little, well, let's call them traditional things that have, that have continued on from that kingdom program. And, and why did they continue on? I'll, I'll tell you primarily, when the Apostle Paul finally died, it would be a very short time that, that the religious world would turn back to Peter and the teachings of the kingdom. The teachings of the kingdom. And by and large, the religious world would adopt the teachings of the kingdom. They would Christianize much of Judaism. The priesthood today 
in Rome is patterned after the, the priests of, of Israel. The baptism practiced today in Christendom is, is, is really just that Old Testament baptism. But they would take those and they would bring them into today and they follow the teachings of Peter. Of Peter. Now that's not to say that the teachings of Paul died off. There were those who continued on in various degrees proclaiming that message of by faith alone, by grace alone. There were those who would continue on and, and hold on to various doctrines of the Apostle Paul. But they would suffer great persecution by the official church. Great persecution by the official church. And it would be hundreds of years, hundreds of years before the, the, the very rudiments of Pauline doctrine would begin to really shine forth again. And even in the period of the so-called Reformation, even in that period alone, it was very small glimpses of real truth that began to blossom. It would not be but for a, a, a hundred, couple hundred years that theologians would start to truly understand the word of God rightly divided. And into the 17 and 1800s, they would begin to see the word of God from a dispensational point of view. Oh, no, they didn't capture it all. They didn't see it all. But they would see enough and they would begin and, they, and, and divisions started to appear and persecution. And it came to the point where the persecution would, would be pretty much verbal, a little more civilized, but it would grow into the 1800s, the late 1800s, the 1900s, the mid-1900s. More and more of Pauline truth was being discovered as the word of God was being rightly divided, as the word of God was opening up. By the late 18, or, or mid-1900s, late 1900s, early 1900s. Dispensationalism was really breaking through. Understanding the word of God from a dispensational point of view. Dr. Schofield's Bible was published in 1917, I believe it was. Somewhere in the early 1900s there. And he really popularized the idea of, of dispensational understanding of the scriptures. Understanding a program God dealt with the nation of Israel and a program God was dealing with the church, the body of Christ. Oh, no, Schofield didn't uncover all the truth. More and more would come. More and more would come. Men such as J.C. O'Hare, Cornelius Stamm, Charles Baker, would begin to write and preach and teach and discover. And at the same time, there were men all over America and around the world who were, who were beginning to see the truth of the word of God and really the truth of the word of God rightly divided. Many of them thought, am I the only one seeing this? And they were silent, often sometimes in fear. But words started to get out. Word started to get out. And they started getting together. Then they started to compare notes. And it's brought us to where we are today. To where we are today. 
sitting here now on the shoulders of those who have gone before, rightly dividing the word of truth. And it's that truth that we need to see, that truth that we need to, to recover. If you ask me, have we uncovered it all? I would say we will never exhaust the word of God. Do we all know it all? Is there anybody who really has it all down? Anybody that tells you that? You need to get out of there as fast as you can. It's a lie. It's a lie. That's why we need to continue to study, to study, to study, to study, to study. And we're going to continue just for the next week or so. And then we'll wrap this all up. And just look at those little things that are different in the program of grace than the program of God dealing with the nation of Israel. But we need to see that as we rightly divide the word of truth. And again, as we do each week, let me just say in closing... That wherever you are today, wherever you are today, you need to know that God loves you. No, he may not like what you're doing right now. He may not like what you've done with your life. But he loves you. And he loves you to the, to the degree that he gave his son To die for you. The Bible says in Romans chapter 6. For God. For, uh, <clears throat> oh. Romans 6 verse 23. For the wages of sin. Is death. For the wages of sin. Is death. In 323 of Romans it said. For all have sinned. And come short of the glory of God. All of us, all of us are born under sin. And the wages of that sin is death. Death. Oh, physical death? Sure. But even more importantly, spiritual death. Eternal separation from God in the lake of fire. But Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but, but the gift, the gift of God is eternal life. How? Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You see, friends, Jesus Christ paid for your sin. He paid that death penalty. And now he offers to you a gift of life that you receive by simple faith and trust in his finished work on your behalf. And right now, if you but put your faith and your trust in his death, believing that he died for you, that he died to pay the price of your sin, that he was buried, that your sin has been dealt with and has been removed, that he rose again victorious, victorious, over sin, death, and the grave, rose again for your justification. If you put your faith and your trust in that, apart from any work, apart from any effort, it isn't your baptism, it isn't a sacrament, it isn't a ceremony, it's strictly your faith in his finished work. Believing that he's done it for you, if you put your faith and your trust in him and him alone right now in your innermost being you say I believe Christ died for me I believe he paid the price of my sin I believe he was buried and I believe he rose again for me victorious for me and I'm going to put my faith and my trust in him as my savior and the moment you take that step of faith you pass from death unto life 
and heaven becomes yours because at that very moment, the Holy Spirit of God takes you and baptizes you, places you into Christ. Into Christ. If you've never taken that step of faith, you need to do it right now. You need to do it right now. None of us are ever promised a tomorrow. None of us are ever promised a tomorrow. And if you've taken that step of faith today for the very first time, I want to send you this little booklet, Beginning Your Life in Christ, and a new Bible, free of charge, free of charge. I'll send that to you. And in order to get that, all you need to do is send me a note. Send me a note. Say, I have put my faith and trust in Christ during your broadcast. That's all you need to say. Give me your name and address. Send it to that mail, that address you see on the screen right now. Bible Doctrines to Live By, Post Office Box 564, Comstock Park, Michigan, 49321. And if you take that step of faith, I'll take you that, I'll send you that little book, I'll send you a Bible, and we'll begin to pray for you. We'll begin to pray for you. I would trust, do not delay. Do not delay. None of us are promised another breath. The only promise we have is for the moment we're in right now. What are you going to do with your moment? With your moment. Trust him today. I, I pray. Trust him today. And if you're watching today and you enjoy the broadcast and you'd like to help us with the broadcast, you can send that also to Bible Doctrines to Live By, Post Office Box 564, Comstock Park, Michigan, 49321. And we will appreciate that. And like I, I, I say every week, <clears throat> I don't make a nickel off of that. I don't make a penny off of that. Uh, all of that will go into our broadcast fund and will be used to pay for the things we use to make this all possible. And so if you'd like to be part of that, you may send your gift and offering. Well, until we meet again next week, uh, I trust that we'll see you Tuesday night for with Matt and the broadcast there. And then we'll see you here next week, Lord willing, live, actually. And uh, we'll be coming here as we begin to wrap up, rightly dividing the word of truth. Good night, everybody. God bless you this week.